You got to be ready. Say, be ready. ready. But I'm telling you to stay ready. This morning, I um, handed this young man who's um, on spring break from Monona State University. Let's give Moses a hand. And he prayed for the offering. About three minutes ago, I handed Tim the microphone. He didn't hesitate. He was ready. Let's give Tim a hand. What would you do if an opportunity showed up at your door? I was doing some business training on Monday night, and, and, and I asked the people, are you even ready for success? Are you ready for significance? Are you ready for God to open a door that no hater, no backbiter, no past, present, or future can shut? Are you ready? And, and, and our responsibility is to really get to know the very thing the very person being the Holy Spirit that will make us ready. This evening, I'm going to talk to you about the mystery of the gospel, which is Jesus Christ. Um, and, and, and I'm really challenging you um, here from a carnal perspective as well as spiritual to begin to operate in your spiritual senses. Um, on Tuesday night, we handed out some note cards. And tonight, when you leave the sanctuary, we're going to hand them out to you on how to do spiritual exercises. I gave you an example of two mighty men um, last week when one had muscles and the other didn't. And you saw that we all have muscles. Say, I got muscles. I got muscles. So in the natural, you have muscles. You have them on your body. Some of our muscles are bigger than other people's muscles. It all comes down to how much you work out. And even if you work out a lot, your muscles may be different than my muscles. They must be might be much bigger, and we're in the gym every day. Everybody's made differently, but we are called to work out. So last week, I talked to you about the mystery of the Holy Spirit. And, and we went, and now we're teaching on Paul over these next several weeks. And Paul is absolutely incredible, and he eliminates all excuses that now Paul was a person that killed Christians. He was called the, the chief sinner, the worst of the worst. But yet God used them anyway. Say anyway. anyway. So we talked about last week about um, how it is that Paul is teaching us about this spirit, which is a mystery. Something that you cannot see, but you will experience and feel in your life and see the results of it in your, in your life. The, the Bible says that the spirit searches the deep things of God. That is your level of intel. It's not just power. Last week, I shut down all the power. Well, it took Jonah to hit the switch to shut it down. This is the intel behind the power that God gives you in his Holy Spirit. And then we began, see, a lot of people, and I, and I checked the, the Tuesday night crowd because I always hear the chatter. Sometimes I let it fall on, on dull ears, but other times I have to address it and correct it and rebuke it. And you saw a lot of people um, being moved in the Holy Spirit and falling out. Now, a lot of you don't understand that because it's a mystery and, and you're not supposed to. I mean, and then, and then we play private detective to say, well, I don't think it's real. They fake falling. Well, I don't know. I don't really like to fake falling. <laughs> I fall. I mean, I'd rather not fake falling. But if I get hit with the Holy Ghost or speak in tongues. But if you don't have that yet, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. Or you don't have faith. But certainly don't sit there and throw stones at somebody else's experience. We want to celebrate things, and a lot of times when you do not understand it, your mind in the carnal perspective begins to shut out God. Because when you, you think too much and you become too intelligent, and you don't know what's going on, and then, you, then your carnal senses shut down. As I said earlier, there's a difference between spiritual and natural senses. Our natural senses are we see, we hear, we smell, we touch, and we taste. So if you can't see it, you're not going to believe it. If you can't touch it, it's not real. But here's the thing. We talk to things we can see, but we won't talk to the God we can't see. So in the Word of God, it talks about that, that this Holy Spirit thing um, searches the deep things of God. And then the Word reference that, that the Spirit in a man, the Spirit of a person, um, is their intellect, their emotions, their fears, and their passions. And a lot of times when we're too carnal, our dreams die. Our ambitions decrease in our human spirit, and our pass passions lessen, and our fear rises. And we have to understand that fear is false evidence appearing real. And fear is not a bad thing. If the Bible says, fear the Lord, that means I respect God and who he is and what he's done for me. But we talked about the spirit, and, and, and this is hard for the natural mind to comprehend. And, and what the natural mind does when it doesn't comprehend or understand something, um, um, I, I love what Stan taught me after the morning service. He says, when you stop trying to understand God, you play God. 
When you quit understanding God, I don't, I don't understand it, so I'm just going to stop pursuing. Now you're playing God. Say, I'm not God. Yeah. You're clearly not God, nor am I. So we talked about the Holy Spirit, and we were talking about the, the attributes and characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you actually believe this and you begin to exercise in the spiritual realms and see the Holy Spirit, really, if you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. Say, I have it. Yeah. But if you have something that you don't use, it doesn't work. Let me say that again. If you have something that you do not use, it doesn't work. So what happens now is we have it once we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. <clears throat> and I tell you, now this is hard to comprehend. That the Holy Spirit will teach you when you study the Word of God. It will give you direct intel um, beyond what you read in the Word of God. That the Word isn't going to tell you who to marry or where to work or where to go or where to worship or what to do. But the Holy Spirit will guide you. It's direct intel. It's important for you to grasp this now. The Holy Spirit, when you're learning, it'll teach you, and it's so powerful, it'll remind you of what you learned. Now, I was the type of guy for 20 plus years on this planet, I forgot what I was supposed to remember, and I remembered which I wish I would have forgotten. We remember our mistakes. We remember the words of death that were spoken over us and our failures or at a young age. We can't forget the, the, the nightmares and the experiences that everyone in this room has seen or experienced in their life or even caused into another person's life. So the Bible says that the Holy Spirit now, you're not going to see this taught in a lot of churches, will, will, will teach you and remind you, and it also says it will lead you. Now the Word of God says, which is Jesus, which I'm going to talk to you about tonight, says that it will give you a lamp to your feet. It'll, the Word, when you read it, will tell you where you are and it will light the path on where you are to go. But it doesn't tell you exactly where to go. That's the intel of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit says that I will lead you. I will be your helper. I will be your advocate. I will tell you what to say, tell you where to go. And it's so powerful because I, I have studied the Word of God. I've studied to show myself approved of workmen. If you can see my notes, that I don't even have them all on the, on the platform right now. I'm studied up, but the Holy Spirit's got to do it now. Yeah. I've done what I needed to do with the Word and studying. It's in me. Now the, the Holy Spirit will take the expression of what I learned and reveal it to you. And like I said on Tuesday night, it's like what I'm teaching you is going to mean something different to everyone in this room. Because everyone in this room grew up differently. Yep. Even if you were in the same household, you had a different experience than your brother did. I'll prove it to you. You can have two brothers under the same roof with two parents. One turns out to be a drug addict and the other one's a CEO. Same parents, same neighborhood, same school, two different people. Say we're all different. We're all different. That's the beauty of this. That we're all different, we bring different attributes and experiences from our lives to the body of Christ. And now it says that I will lead you, but now it goes so far to say I will guide you. Say guide me. Guide. <laughs> I talked about the difference between going fishing on your own or going fishing with a guide. If somebody points to a Mille Lacs Lake and says that's where they're catching them, well, if they take me to where they're catching them, now that's what Jesus said, be fishers of men. And that's not gender specific. So the Holy Spirit will tell you who to talk to who's ready to be saved. The Holy Spirit will give you an indication of when the room is right to ask for a salvation call. call. The Holy Spirit with Jesus now, and it's so profound, will guide me into all truth and also tell me about my future. Now I want you to think about that now because this is a mystery and your mind's going to shut down. And it's normal for your mind to shut down, but I'm asking you to persevere. How can this thing that I don't see teach me and remind me what I learned? How can this thing that I don't see lead me where to go? How can this thing that I don't see tell me what to say? How can this thing that I don't see guide me into all truth when it comes? And it won't speak because it's got a direct connect to the Father. It's part of the Trinity. And it's given me direct intel of who God is and who God says I am. You will never know your purpose without a relationship with the Holy Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit reveals your purpose. Read your Bible. That's the expression of the love letter of who Jesus is. But it doesn't tell you what you're supposed to do in your life. It tells you how to love. It tells you how to overcome. But this Holy Spirit, this person, I'm here to tell you, it's so precious. It tells me where to go. It tells me what to say. It tells me what to study. It, it tells me what to do. I'm here to tell you. So, so I've learned this. So, so now tonight we're going to talk about the mystery of the gospel. 
Now, I'm here to tell you, without the Holy Spirit, I would not be able to learn this book because I'm not a very good reader. And I'm not telling you because I have low self-worth. I'm just not my strong suit. I got high activity up here, ADD, ADHD. So it's very difficult for me to read. But without the Holy Spirit, it would stay difficult for me to read. But because of the Holy Spirit, I'm now learning how to read at a different level. I was in a car studying theology and commentary um, on Friday night, and I had radio going. It was really hard for me to focus. Say focus. <laughs> but I've learned now that if I put in the effort, the Spirit will join me, and I can learn about this mystery. Say mystery. mystery. So, Lord, I ask that you think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords. Holy, Holy Spirit, I ask that you join us tonight in a way that is undeniable, that you will speak to people directly through your expression of your word and the principles of it. But it's not just the principles of the word that we learn tonight, that you will empower us through your spirit to execute and live out, to be empowered to live out the scriptures. Lord, I love you so much. You have done so many things. I ask for forgiveness of all the things that are in me that are not of you. I receive the forgiveness that I may be in this moment a purified vessel on your behalf. In your name we pray, amen. Let's give God a hand. <laughs> Say cotton mouth. cotton mouth. Say cotton mouth. Cotton mouth. I got cotton mouth. Yeah. Is it hot in here? Yeah. Yeah. Praise God, it's hot in here in March. We don't have the heater on, we got the air conditioning on. Let's give God a hand for that. The definition of mystery is something that is difficult. If serving God was easy, everyone would do it. And I was thinking about it this afternoon. Let's say this church isn't your flavor and you go to a church that is. But I want you to examine your history with, with being part of a church and ask yourself, have you been loyal to the church that God has called you to? Because it's difficult to be loyal. There's opposition internally and externally. And again, if serving God was easy, everyone would do it. The world wouldn't be in the shape that it's in. And, and the schools wouldn't be in the shape that it's in. But this mystery that we have to tap into and investigate, um, and, and at times it seems impossible. Um, but the Bible says in the expression of who God is and who Jesus is, that with God all things are possible. Say it's possible. Say it's difficult, it's difficult. But, but it's possible. Wow. Now, it's impossible in your own strength, in your own limited carnal thinking, but it's extremely possible when you access the Holy Spirit and activate the principles of the Word of God in your life to understand. Now, now I mean, you can read the, the gospel, and, and, and it isn't easy to understand for all of us. Maybe for you it is, but for me it isn't, so I have to really stare at it and dig into it. Um, but it's worth gaining understanding, as the Bible says, in all you're getting, get understanding. But, but, but as a leader, as a pastor, as a servant, um, my goal is to transmit a message of the word through the Holy Spirit that is somewhat easier to understand, a message um, that, that does not completely go over your head. My dad taught me a long time ago in business, in church, to eat the meat and leave the bones. If it does not go on your radar and goes over your head, don't stop listening. Because there's going to be something said tonight that could change the course of your life that's going to allow you to respond. Say, I'm in. Amen. And then it goes on, difficult, impossible to understand or explain. So uh, for 15, almost 16 years, now 16 years, let's give God a hand for that. <laughs> I'm here 16 years later because I'm not perfect. I'm here 16 years later and I haven't made all the right decisions. I'm here 16 years later because, not because I haven't sinned in these 16 years. I'm here 16 years later because I know the Holy Spirit. I know the love of Jesus. I know about forgiveness. I know about grace. I know about mercy. I know about authenticity and transparency and really the divine power of who God is. Let me tell you, God doesn't use perfect people. And I'll, I'll prove it to you because none of us are. So God can't say all I do is use perfect people because there is not a perfect person. So, so, so it's been difficult for me to explain, I mean, especially prior to birthing the church seven years ago, when you've got hundreds of um, you know, people that are getting out of prison and addicts and alcoholics, they, they don't even want to learn. But they don't want to live the way they were living. And I'm not making a blanket statement there. 
I was one of those guys. Now, I wasn't rebellious, like, oh, forget what the pastor's saying. I just had no interest in learning what he had to say. So I would attend a, 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 a church service like this, but, but I, it, was, it was so hard to understand, and I thought all these impossibilities. Now, Paul is coming to us. Say Paul. Paul is incredible, um, and he eliminates all excuses. And, and I love what he's telling us, the mystery of the gospel. Say mystery. mystery. So I love what it says, the first three words, for this reason. If you ever forget your reason, you won't last. The reason is the why behind the what. You can look in your professional life. Why do you go to work? You know, the what is work, but why? To support your family, to support the kingdom. What is it? What is the reason why you're doing it? See, a lot of people have ill motives and they have false reasons. They appear they're, they're legit, but in time, the, the truth will be told of what their really motives are. And don't even resent that if you're one of those people, because I have been that when my motives weren't pure, but I learned over time that I, that wouldn't work. So say reason. reason. Now, this is important to get. It says, I, Paul a prisoner of Christ on, on behalf of you, the Gentiles. I want to stop right there. Now, Paul was in a Roman prison. He was in a Roman prison for preaching the gospel. How many of you have been in jail or prison? Raise your hands. So we know what it's like to be in jail or prison. When you're in jail or prison, you lose certain privileges. And I want you to really look at Paul's mindset here. Paul was sitting basically under house arrest in the prison. He could move around during the day, but they had him chained at night. But Paul didn't look at the fact that he was actually in prison under the Roman government. He said, I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ when he was in prison. I want to really elaborate on what that means. When you are a prisoner of Jesus Christ, you are not your own. And I want to elaborate that on that, because I see Christians that think they're like these holy grails, praise God, hallelujah, that like to raise their hands and everything else, but they got hate in their heart. When, and they got gossip in their heart, and they got judgment, and they won't let go, and they won't forgive. When Jesus Christ is like Matt Richmond taught us, I mean, it, Jesus is forgiveness, now, we understand that forgiveness is a process. It's not an event, and it'll take time. But we understand being a prisoner, prisoner of Christ means that I can't tell you my opinion about that. I'm a prisoner. I can't go there. I'm a prisoner. I can't bite back. I'm a prisoner. I can't go and, and react to what they said about me. I'm a prisoner. I can't go and wonder about my haters. I'm a prisoner. I can't worry about what they're saying. I'm a prisoner. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. I flow with the Holy Ghost. I have forgiveness in my heart and love in my steps. I have mercy in my hands and grace in my sight. I'm a prisoner. Say, I'm a prisoner. But sometimes we break out of prison and judge people. I'll know I'm out of prison if I'm judgmental. If I'm talking garbage about a person, and I try not to do that, rarely do I do it, and it's always done. But when you're a prisoner of Jesus Christ, you have freedom. Say freedom. freedom. Now, that's a mystery. How can I have freedom if I'm a prisoner? See, when you think you want to go do and say and act however you want to do it, you're going to be free. But actually, those things in prison, you say, I'm a prisoner. I'm a prisoner. So, so Paul is saying, I'm a prisoner, but he's a prisoner on behalf of the Gentiles. Now, I'm going to take you a little deeper on the theology here. Now, the Jews basically were about the religion, and, and in the Old Testament, there was a prophecy that said that the Gentiles, before Jesus came, would experience salvation. But the prophecy never said that the Gentiles and the Jews would be in the same church. And I want you to look now at how it is where that still stands today. That we have this denominational divide when some of us, if not all of us in church on this given Sunday, believe in Jesus, but we don't believe in the traditions that another church might have. I don't care about traditions. I care about transformation. You have to understand Jesus has to do with transformation. So Paul is trying to win them over on behalf of the Gentiles, assuming, now this is so powerful because I know you're going to be able to relate to it, 
What Paul is saying, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given me for you. Do you understand that God saved you for someone else? That God freed you to teach somebody else about his freedom? That Paul is saying, hold up, I'm sure you heard that I used to kill Christians. Hey, I'm sure you heard that I used to smoke crack. But I'm sure you also heard about the grace power of Jesus Christ. I'm also sure you heard about the forgiveness of the cross. I'm sure you heard that, you know what, he picked me up and turned me around and placed me on solid ground. I'm sure you heard I grew up in a drug addict family for some of you, but yet I went to school anyway. I'm sure you heard about the grace of Jesus in my life. What did Paul teach us last week? It's not about your message, it's about your testimony. Now Paul is teaching us, he's like, hold up, I'm sure you heard I was on the Damascus Road ready to kill you. And Jesus met me, and now I'm here to talk to you about him. That's powerful. That's powerful. That that will get the ear of that testimony of anyone. And he said, given to me for you, how the mystery, say mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. Now, when Paul was in prison here in in the Roman Empire, he wrote Ephesians, he wrote Colossians, he wrote Philippians, and he wrote Philemon. What do you do when you're down? See, when I'm down, I get creative. When they come against me, I, I experience power. When, when, they, when, when, they, when, when, when all else is failing, I activate Jesus. And I claim the word of God. And, and Paul is writing this now, and, and it's so profound to me because it's a mystery. But think about it now. Jesus is gone. He, had to, he wasn't part of the 12 disciples, yet Paul is an apostle. And now Paul is, is getting this revelation from the Spirit. Say Spirit. Now, Paul uses that revelation, which what I'm teaching you this evening, out of the Holy Spirit and his experience to teach us who Jesus is. Say, who's Jesus? Jesus. Now he'll tell us. He says, when you read this, perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, not to make moan. So he said, hold up. In this culture, I'm not supposed to tell the Gentiles this. I'm just tell, to tell the truth. Have you ever had anybody say, well, hey, hey, don't worry with him. He'll never understand it anyway. But Paul said, hold up. Say, hold up. hold up. This is available to anyone and everyone, no matter what they have done. Can't you see the grace that was demonstrated on me? I used to kill Christians. So that eliminates whatever shame and guilt you're walking in. And then he says, the mystery of the Gentiles, the fellow heirs, that they have the same inheritance for those Jews that believe in Jesus, members of the same body, partakers in the promise of Christ Jesus and the gospel. Say gospel. So the gospel is an expression. Say expression. So you need to know who Jesus is. This is the word of God. This is Christ in written form. And Paul is getting a revelation uh, to tell us and teach us who Jesus really is. Say Jesus. Jesus. Now it goes on to say in verse 7, of this gospel, I was made a minister. The word minister, say I'm a minister. minister. The word minister in the Greek is more or less a waiter, okay? Um, In today's world, they call them servers in a restaurant, okay? So, so basically in the Greek, the word minister is, is, a, is a server or a waiter. Here's the thing that, that Grace and I were talking about after this morning. See, I'm going to serve you and wait for God to speak to you. So when you're a waiter, you're actually a server. And while you're a server, you got to be a waiter because you're waiting on the grace of God to speak to the person through your vocal cords. Check this out. So, so it says, a waiter bidding to its customers. So what Paul is saying, I'm trying to win people for Jesus. Say Jesus. Jesus. Check this out. This is profound to me. And now he goes on to say that though I am the very least, Paul doesn't have a big ego. We, we heard last week that he came with fear and trembling. If you were here on Tuesday night, I was freaking out with those demonic forces that were in this room. Fear and trembling, we're talking about grace. You have to understand, those who have experienced extreme grace when they weren't following Jesus have an extreme plan from Jesus himself. Check this out. He he goes on to say, I am the very least of all the saints. Saints, the grace, say grace. 
Paul's not thinking he's all that in a bag of chips. He's just focusing on the grace. Say grace. grace. So you, you, you got to know this grace to preach to the Gentiles unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone the plan of the mystery hidden. Say mystery. mystery. That God has created all things. So who are you to say that Jesus isn't for the Gentiles? Who are you to say that Jesus isn't for that prostitute? Who are you to say Jesus isn't for that leader that fell? Who are you to say that Jesus isn't for anybody? Because Jesus is for everyone. Say Jesus. Jesus. Now he goes on to say that this mystery and bring to the light for everyone the plan of the mystery hidden of God who created all things. That through the church, say church. church. Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church. The church is very important to Jesus. And manifold wisdom through the church of God, might now be known to the rulers and authorities. Now, when I studied the theology of this, I really understood what happened on Tuesday night. I studied deep theology and commentary on that particular passage within the, what I'm teaching. These rulers in heavenly realms are both angels and demons. You better understand, as you sit here tonight in this church, in the heavenly realms watching us right now, what you're not going to understand are angels and demons. These things are watching us very, very close. These demons are making you think a certain way right now, not being able to pay attention, being distracted, not hearing the word, not knowing that this grace is available to you, understanding that Paul is only reason why Paul is where he is is because of grace. Say grace. grace. This was according to the eternal purpose and was realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom boldness, access, and confidence through our faith. Now, if you were to know me outside of this room when I'm not really, I mean, I, hopefully the Holy Spirit's always with me, but when I'm teaching the Word of God, I'm a very shy, quiet, anxious individual. But when the Holy Spirit is rolling, yeah. when the Word of God is in me, there is no excuse to be shy and anxious. Because the Holy Spirit is bigger than my anxiety and much bigger than my shyness. And he says boldness and directness. I'm here, I mean, my people-pleasing butt just wants to make friends with all of you. But I'd rather make enemies by telling you the truth and getting you free and understanding who Jesus is than sitting up here and singing Kumbaya. So, so what Paul is telling, so Paul's starting to offend them. He goes, well, hold up, I'm bold, I'm confident, not in me, in him. Now it goes on to say, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father. In this culture, the Jewish religion, they would not get on their knees even though Jesus got on his knees in Gethsemane. They would pray with their hands raised and, and, and standing. Now Paul was breaking the mold. He was changing the dynamics of who Jesus really is from the family in heaven and on earth, that we have a cloud of witnesses cheering us on right now, praying, interceding, hoping that you will make the right choices, hoping that you will investigate this mystery of the gospel and the Holy Spirit, that you will ask God to help you pay attention so you're not emotionally broke. And now it goes on to say this. This is what really gets me. That you are strengthened with power. Say power. power. Through his spirit. Say spirit. spirit. On your inner being. Yeah. How strong are you inside? How strong are you? Can you take that crazy, wicked, nasty, stanky thought that you just thought a second ago? And can you bring it to the cross and make it obedient to Jesus? See, you have to understand these thoughts that come in our head about people, places, and things. This is what Paul is teaching. If you have that, you don't have Jesus operating in your inner being for that Christ may dwell in your heart. So you've got to let Jesus move into your life. You got to let him settle and pick up residence, home in your hearts. And now it goes on to say that you are grounded in love. This is very important for you to get. It takes strength to love people. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins. That if you ain't got this love, you ain't got this Jesus. You can quote scriptures. You can give to the poor, but if you ain't got this love rolling, the Bible says, Jesus said before he left, another commandment I give you. Love one another as I love you. I see people saying they love Jesus when they don't love us. See, see, when you don't have this love, the, the, read the screen, it says it surpasses 
all knowledge. I don't understand, brother, how I can still love you after you said that to me. Sister, I don't understand how I can still love you when you did the actual opposite of what you said you were going to do and then blame me for it. Sister, I don't understand why you fell in the very sin that we all have and now you're judging my sin and won't look at your own. This love surpasses all knowledge. It doesn't make any sense. It's a mystery, but it says it's wide, it's deep, it's long. Check out what the Bible says. This love is so potent the Bible says it's, you got to be grounded in it, and it says that it's wide. The love of God in Christ Jesus is so wide that it includes every person. The love is so wide that it includes every person. It's so long, it lasts through eternity. It's so deep that it reaches even the worst sinner. This love is so, it's so high, it will take you to heaven. This love cannot be measured. Without this love, Paul is teaching us, without this grace, without this Holy Spirit, without this gospel, which is Jesus, you are missing it. Say, I don't want to miss it. Now check out verse 20. Now to him who is able, say God is able, God is able. to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think according to the power, say power, power. which is the Holy Spirit, at work within us. Now I want you to think about that. That love is so deep, it'll reach the worst person. It is so long, it'll take you through heaven. It is so high, it is so radical, that you won't understand it when you're operating in this love. That you will lay down your life for those people. See, they didn't kill Jesus, he laid down his life. They did not kill him. He let him, he laid down his life. When you operate in this love, you will lay down your life because you are a prisoner to Jesus. You said it. I'm not repeating it. I don't have an opinion about it. I'm serving Jesus. When you are a prisoner, you are actually free. You're actually free. Now, check this out. Hold up. Hold up. No. I got this grace. I was a crack addict. I've been to treatment 11 times. I've failed so many times, I can't count. I've actually failed in ministry too, but yet he still uses me. And, 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 and I'm not perfect, but, but yet I have this spirit that will tell me where to go and tell me what to say and teach me and remind me what it taught me. It'll lead me. It'll guide me into all truth. It'll tell me about my future. But now it's saying that more or less that God is so supernatural that you won't even be able to think up what he's got for you. Again, it's a mystery. Now check this, I'll prove it to you. You can ask or think. Thinking is imagining. Okay, what does God really have for me? Without the Holy Spirit, you'll never know your purpose. So, so now I can only ask God for things within my carnal experiences. Things that I've experienced in my life and things that I've heard you talk about experiencing in your life that I would love to do. That's our experience together. Now, I'm limited if all I can do is ask God for that. God is saying, I can give you more than anything they experienced or you ever experienced. Now think, I can take you beyond anything you can name and claim. You can't even name what I'm going to give you. You haven't seen it. You don't understand it. It's supernatural. Look around the room. All this stuff we're walking in today wasn't asked for, and you couldn't think it up. And if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. Because my God doesn't play favorites, and he's doing it for all of us. Say he can do it. Say he can do it like you believe it. He says, but this power of the Holy Spirit, so, so what is the gospel? The definition of the, the word gospel is a teaching which is happening right now of a revelation of who Christ is. Christ is love. Christ is forgiveness. Christ is mercy. Christ wants to dwell and make home in our hearts. And really, the word is the expression. The spirit empowers you to live out the expression. The, 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 the word is the principle. The spirit allows you to live out the principle and disregard your feelings because you're a prisoner to Jesus. This isn't maybe even attractive to you being a prisoner. I'm a prisoner. And being a prisoner keeps me from things. Being a prisoner doesn't allow me to do everything I want to do and say everything I want to say and feel everything I want to feel. 
because the expression allows me to take the feeling and the thought captive to bring to the cross to get my freedom to be empowered to live the principle. I'm teaching real deep. It may be going over your head. Hang on. Say, hang on. Hang on. Say, hang on. hang on. I mean, you got to learn. The, the, last week we talked about what God has prepared for those who love him. See, a lot of us, we haven't seen it yet, but it's prepared. Say, it's for me. So it's the revelation about Christ. So the word says that, that in Hebrews 4.12, the gospel will come alive in your life. Now say mystery. mystery. Hebrews 4.12 says that this book, for some of you, this is just a book. And that's all it is, and that's all it's ever been. Because it's a mystery, and it's hard to explain, and it's hard to understand, you don't investigate it. Now, if something in my natural life became a mystery that I wanted the answers on, I would investigate. Say investigate. investigate. Now, it isn't going to make any carnal sense when Hebrews 4.12 says that this is alive and active. Sharper than a double-edged sword. It divides evenly. When it cuts you, it gets all of the stronghold. It doesn't leave 10% of it in your body. It divides evenly, and it goes on to say, for soul and spirit, some of you have soul ties to strongholds of abuse. This can remove the soul tie of what that brother did to you. This can remove the pain. This can remove, it's the expression, and the, the spirit will empower you. But check this out. It says, joints and marrows. In the human makeup, the design of a human body, the joints and marrows are the closest things to each other. The word of God is so powerful that, that it'll even, and it judges the thoughts and attitude of the heart. Now, check this out. Now, this is why. I mean, you got to get this. You have to. I really encourage you to look into this. Now, hold up. The attitude is an expression. The thought, I haven't said what I thought about. Now, if I get this word in me and it's alive and active, what's going to be alive and active in me is going to be the Holy Spirit. Now, hold up. I just thought something really bad about Pastor Terry. Now, I really didn't, but she's an angel, but I'll use her so no one else gets twisted. It just judged me because I judged her. It judged my attitude about her and it judged my heart towards her. Now, if you don't have this in you, you're going to be spouting out at the mouth about everybody. Talking bad never looks you, makes you look good. Let me say that again. Talking bad never makes you look good. I heard some things about some this week, and I'm like, hold up, man. I don't care what they do or what, what, what they said was being done. That is not Jesus. You're not God. I'm not God. The battle is not ours, it's God's. Say it's God's. God. So you know what, when you got this, oh, that, that, alive and active? This don't make no sense. How is this alive and active? But when you deposit this in you, the spirit will extract it out of you and you will see it working in front of you. And then you'll get the intel and you'll know what to say. I've done a lot of drugs this brain is fried, but the Spirit tells me what to say and reminds me what I studied. See, if he can do it for me, he can do it for you, but you don't want to do it. It's a mystery. Alive and active. What are those paper clips? How can this be alive and active? You've got to get beyond your carnal thinking. You got, and now it goes on to say in 2 Timothy 3 that the gospel, say gospel. gospel. See, will guide and equip you. It says all scripture, say all. all. That when you activate this in your life through study and meditation, it's the breath of God over your life. It said as God breathe is useful. When you have this mystery working in your life, you're not useless you're useful. You're a sinner that's been saved by grace. You are a prisoner of Jesus. You are free indeed. The truth is setting you free and sanctifying you. But here's the thing. Here's the criteria. In order to be useful, in order for you, you got to be taught. And along with being taught, you got to be rebuked, which is a stern correction. You cannot take rejection as correction. 
You, you know, I correct you and now you feel rejected. And, 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 and you gotta understand, you know, the Holy Spirit, when I got the word in me and I'm judging Pastor Terry, I get convicted. Because I got the spirit in me. I, I can't do that. It, I'm a prisoner. So now it says teaching, um, um, correcting, training, and rebuking. And, and, and now it says if you do these things, you'll be thoroughly equipped for every good work. On hold up, Pastor Jeff. Last week you told me that the spirit's going to tell me what to say, guide me, teach me and remind me what I learned, and actually lead me where I'm supposed to go. Now you're telling me that that book up on the pulpit is alive and active, and now you're telling me that it's the breath of God and it's gonna thoroughly equip me for a year full of hogwash. <laughs> Say mystery. mystery. It's worth investigating. Yes. Yeah. It's worth investigating. Yeah. It's worth everything to investigate. And, and it's saying that it'll thoroughly equip you for every good work, not bad work. So that means that you got to be corrected. you got to be rebuked at times. you got to be trained and you got to be taught. Now it says in James 1, the gospel will give you your assignment. Do not merely listen to the word so you deceive yourself. Do you know that you're deceived if you come to a church or your recovery meeting and you listen to a principle, which is the word, which is an expression, and you never apply it? You're totally deceived. And the reason why is you cannot understand it because it's difficult, but the Bible says, do what it says. Say, do it. Yes. Now it goes on to say, anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says is like a man who goes to the mirror and forgets what he looks like. That's an identity crisis. Now you come to church on Sunday. You know, I got some high-level executives that are here tonight. They say, when I come and I hear the word and the power of the Spirit in you, it's electrifying, and I go out there during the week. Some of us are Sunday warriors and Monday wimps. We just fizzle out as soon as we leave the church. We don't have the Spirit. We don't have the word activated in us. And now it's saying you forget that, that you can do all things through Christ that gives you strength. You forget that you are overcome through the blood of the Lamb and the word of the... You forget that you're forgiven as far as the east to the west. You forget that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You forget now that, that God says that there is no weapon. Talk to all you want to about what's going on here. I'll take it a step further. I was coaching a guy this week, an executive that used to work at an old, uh, that he works at a company, and he was getting advice from a person that used to work there, that, that quit there and got twisted about working there. I said, why in the world would you be going for direction with an ex-employee? That's like Pastor Terry, um, when he, she was pastoring at a church at Living Word, somebody that was resenting her or even me here, somebody that no longer goes here, you're going to go for advice for? That don't make no sense. If you can get twit, I, here's what I'll tell you. I'm not concerned about what they said. I'm concerned about that you listen to what they said. That's right. That's right. Oh, that went right over your head. What is it about you that they can bring that information? Like some of you may be spies in here tonight trying to figure out what's going on. Go find a church that you like. Life is too short to worry about what we're doing. Just go find somewhere that you like. I mean, I'm not going to go. If I have a company, I'm not, I'm, if I did not and I work for a company, I'm not going to go, well, you got, you're not there anymore. You don't like the place when you were there, and now you're talking bad about the place because you're no longer. Oh, how do I survive at this place? Why would I go to a person that couldn't survive telling me how to survive? Amen. Say it's a mystery. mystery. It's a mystery. So, so, so now it, it's so profound to me what it says here. And, and, and so I, Now, here's the thing. It says, anyone who listens to this word and does not do what it says, but whoever looks intently, it's hard to look intently into this with this ADD, ADHD, but my life depends on it. Amen. My life depends on me looking intently into this, and I've been doing it, exercising for 16 years, and far from perfect, and I've fallen short many times, and God has picked me back up. But at the end of the day, the Bible says do it and, and, and practice doing it and look intently into the law, the word, the truth that gives freedom, and it says continue to do it. There's a reason why this word is so heavy. This word is so heavy because your freedom depends on you reading it. 
The Bible says, read it, look intently to it, and continue to do it in your freedom. But if some of you went home to your house right now, this is how your Bible would look. <laughs> if your Bible's dusty, your life is rusty. <sighs> Blow off the dust. It isn't cocaine. It's dust. <laughs> Blow it off. <laughs> My freedom depends on me getting into this book. My freedom depends on this book. It's where I got my freedom. It's where I learned principles. There's a reason why the devil has this full of cobwebs on your shelf. Even this big book isn't that heavy. Well, when you go home tonight, it'll be the least interested book in the room to pick up. There's a reason why that is. There's a reason because your freedom depends on it. Dust it off. Say, dust it off. Say, dust it off. And you won't be rusty and rigid. You'll experience the grace. You'll do what it says. And you'll fail miserably like I do sometimes and fall into things that I shouldn't be in. But at the end of the day, his grace is sufficient for me. That his power is made perfect in my weakness. Say grace. grace. Isaiah 55, the word that comes, this that comes out of, this is the mouthpiece of God. Will not return empty. If you're empty, you don't have word in you. And if you're empty without the word in you, you're going to look for things that are not the word to fill you up. And you'll get filled up temporarily from the things that are not the word, and you'll be more empty than you've ever been after that is over with. Say, I don't want to be empty. It says, but it accomplishes. See, this always accomplishes. God is not going to lose his reputation over you and your circumstance. What I desire and achieve the purpose from which I sent it. God is sending you purpose on point with purpose. It says in John 17, the gospel will set you apart, that there should be something different about you. With the word working you, with the spirit running through you, the Bible says that you are sanctified, set apart by the truth. Without the word, you're not legitimate. When I read the theology on the commentary, I'm just bringing you stuff that I'm studying and then applying it to the crowd that God has entrusted me with. Because I'm really just a waiter. I'm really just a servant. I'm serving you the word. I'm running through the Holy Spirit. But I can't control if you eat it. I can't control if you eat it. So it says, where are you at today? Isaiah 55. Are you exalting your word above his? Because you don't understand it, now you are God. You are right. We all do it. You don't talk or I don't talk to anybody more than myself. You can't always see me talking to myself, but I'm always talking to myself. I got to start listening to him. I got to allow him to override me. I got to do the things that he has called me to do. Because he said, if I'm willing to be taught and trained and rebuked and corrected, that he'll thoroughly equip me. Doesn't make sense. Because when he told me he would thoroughly equip me, all I had was garage sale furniture, $100 in my pocket, and two drug addicts like me that wanted to get high that were sleeping in the same room as me. I'm like, well, how are you going to equip this? He told me that you read who I am, it's going to become alive in your life. And no matter what the storms are in your life, if you come to me with prayer, petition, and thanksgiving and tell me what you need, you're going to have peace that don't make sense, and it's a mystery. And then it's alive in my life that I am more than a conqueror, that I can do all things through Christ, that I will fall and dust myself off and get back up, that sometimes I'll break out of prison, and I'm not a prisoner of Christ. I'm a prisoner of me. And I go after what I want to do, and then I run back to be a prisoner. So the Bible says that he's smarter than you. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His ways are higher than yours. See, and then you see people that God's using in a mighty way, that have the word in them, that are flowing with the Holy Ghost, and instead of gleaning from them, you're intimidated by them. 
That too is an assignment from the devil. That your bread is in their mouth. And there's a reason why the devil's talking to you about your leaders, whoever they may be tonight. Your pastors, well, don't listen to them. The, the reason why the devil's telling you that is he don't want you to know the truth. I mean, the devil doesn't talk to something that doesn't have value. I loved it. I had, I had one guy that was really struggling with me, and I said, hey, I'm not everybody's flavor. I'm not offended. I know who I am in Christ. But on Tuesday, I accepted Jesus Christ at this altar. That's God. That's God. If you don't quit, you win. One of Pingree's guys, man, it's just being honest, it's hard. I don't really understand God. Tuesday night. See, sometimes you got to really experience evil. And there was evil present on Tuesday here. But here's what God says. He says, Hebrews 5, he says, are you exercising your spiritual muscles? For whom we have much to say. For 16 years I've been saying this. But it's hard to explain. You have been dull in your hearing. If you become dull in your hearing, you're no longer interested in what this word is, what this Holy Spirit is. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone again and again and again for me to teach you the first principles of the oracles of God. And you come to need milk, not solid food. For everyone who partakes only in milk and never investigates is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Say babe. babe. Could you be coming to meetings in church for all these years and still be an infant? And it's okay, at least you're still here. You're still here and I commend you for that. It's time to grow. It's time to expand. It's time how to learn how to use your throat and your voice and digest some solid food. But solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, the ones who can be corrected and rebuked, those by reason of use of their senses exercise, say exercise. exercise. It's not going to be easy to read this. It's going to take discipline. It weighs a thousand pounds, but my freedom depends on it. But I learned how to exercise. Now I, I, I'm like, hold on, leave me alone. I got to study. It's like, what? That wasn't me 15 years ago or even five years ago. I got to get in the truck so I can turn my overhead lights on and pull out my highlighters. I want to get to know Jesus today. I'm excited. Oh, my God. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. God is so cool. God is so cool. You know what? He blesses me in business, too. Because he told me, you know what? Put me first. Learn my expression and operate in my spirit, and I'll give you everything you need. And when he started to bestow things that I thought I needed, I came to realize there's a difference between a want and a need. I thank God for unanswered prayers. If I would have gotten everything I was prayed for, I'd be dead. So God does this, and he says, you're still a babe. You're not exercising. Now, I'm going to show you a miracle. This is a miracle. This is a two-week-old miracle. This is a babe. This is a babe, and this is a miracle. Say miracle. miracle. So if God could take care of Jude in Crystal's womb, why can't God take care of him outside of the womb? But if all we ever feed you, Jude, is milk, you're never going to grow. But it's the very milk that exercises your larynx and your throat and your muscles that will eventually allow you to chew solid food. I really challenge you to not be a spiritual babe. But if all we ever did is give you milk, your brain won't develop, your muscles won't develop, your legs won't develop, and we would fail you, Jude. So when your mama's ready, she's going to bring a little mush into your diet. And after she brings a little mush into your diet, we're going to chop up a little meat for you to chew on. Once we see you with those teeth, we're going to increase what we're feeding you. And after we increase what we're feeding you, you're going to grow. And you're not just going to sit up. 
you're going to crawl. And you're not just going to crawl, you're going to stand. And you're not just going to stand, you're going to walk. And you're not just going to walk, you're going to stand for Jesus. We have a responsibility to you, Jude, to not just give you milk. Let's give this world changer a round of applause. I bestow future leadership over this brother. And maybe tonight some of you are a babe. And that's okay. But it's not okay to stay there. Look what the Bible says in Matthew 22. Could you have been wrong this whole time? Let me say it again. Could you have been wrong this whole time? But Jesus answered them. Oh, I'm so grateful that my mom who's here tonight taught me about this book. She put me this in front of me. She put it at my bedside. It collected dust. I used it as a plate to eat food off of. I might have even done some other things on it because it is a hard service. Maybe you've heard about the grace that's been given to me. Maybe you heard that he loved me in spite of me. Maybe you heard that God uses me, a filthy drug addict, pastor with problems because maybe if you hear it you'll believe it for you too here's what Jesus says you are wrong there's a chance you could have been wrong Jeff all these years because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God I've been wrong I was wrong for 38 years years of my life. I tasted success in sports and business. I was a raving lunatic drug addict. I was wrong the whole time. Even when I was doing right, it didn't feel right because I did not know this. This is not a sprint to read the Bible in three weeks. Start with a proverb of day. That's what God told me our assignment is in the next 30 days. So what you do is you go, I think, is it March 8th? So it's March 8th, you go home, it's a two minute exercise and you'll grow your muscles. Read Proverbs 8, tomorrow read Proverbs 9, on Tuesday read Proverbs 10, on Wednesday read Proverbs 11 and I think you got it from there. <laughs> the date has to do with the chapter. Say, okay. okay. So we're in error, we're wrong if we do not know the scriptures. We're wrong in our thinking, our feeling, our doing and our living. Matthew 7 says, therefore, everyone who hears these words, tonight you heard his word and you saw the Holy Spirit demonstrate what the word is, puts them into practice. I've been practicing the word for 16 years. When the wind came, oh, the wind was blowing this week. Woo! The wind was coming hard against our faces and it wasn't the Holy Spirit. When the streams rose, oh, it got real high up in here. Streams rose, the wind came, and, and then the rain came, a hard rain this week. But I didn't fall. But those who do not put this word in practice, the rain came, the streams rose, and the wind blew. And because they had no word in them, they put their life on the sand. They're always singing. And they came to a great crash. When you crash as much as I have, because I didn't have the word in me. I'm here to tell you, I got so much word in me because I learned from my mom and it took, the Bible says, train a child in the way they should go and when they were old, they will return to it. Well, Pastor Terry and Jean Hill, two mothers that are here tonight, I'm sorry it took me 35 years old, mom. I thought it would happen when I was adult, when I'm 18, but you claimed that over my life. You trained me, you planted, you watered, but only God could make it grow. So I was 35 years old and everything that you taught me. Pastor Terry, your son, you trained him. You prayed for him. You spoke over him. And it took him just as long as it took me. But now he's a leader in the church. Other parents that are here tonight with your children, you set the path. And tonight they're gonna grow. 
and they're not dead. Let's give a God a hand for that. Say I'm not dead. Say I'm not dead. Say I got a life. I got a great life. I got the abundant life. I got freedom. I got peace. I got purpose. I got presence. I got Jesus. I got the spirit. But that great crash did something to you. And the last scripture as we close says, I will send a word, say word. word. So on behalf of the expression, which is the Bible, as your pastor, if I am that to you, or you're just visiting as the pastor of this house, I love you. I will disappoint you, but I will never stop loving you. I will never stop loving you. I'm tired of the people that have great people in their lives that do a great work and they mess up one time and now you discount anything they ever did. I don't want those people around me. We got your back. I don't advise you to screw up, but if you do, you still got our love because we want to represent deeply rooted in love. Don't be ashamed of the things you've done. The Bible says that I will send a word. Right now I'm asking in the name of Jesus to send a word that will heal you and deliver you from destruction. Healing is here. Say it's here. here. So you're back up again. But you need a healing from when you were in that pit. Because in that pit you picked up some behaviors and thoughts and memories that you can't shake. And in order for us to advance you from milk to meat, you got to have a healing, and that healing is going to prevent the destruction that that wound could take you to. So healing is here tonight, and I believe that the word was sent. I've given you everything of God. I've sweat out of my clothes. I've studied before, until I couldn't think. Why? Because I absolutely, positively adore and love you. And I love you with his love, because I didn't know what love was. But when I met my Savior, and I got his word in me, and I operated in the Holy Ghost, my life changed, and it's never been the same. Healing is here. Say it's here. here. I want you to go to the darkest place when you crashed, the memory that you can't shake, and I want you to bring it to this altar. Healing is here.